Chapter 4 of Cleopatra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Calm Dragon. Cleopatra by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 4 Cleopatra's Father. Rome, the rival of Alexandria. Extent of their rule. Extension of the Roman Empire. Cleopatra's father. Ptolemy's ignoble birth. Caesar and Pompey. Ptolemy purchases the alliance of Rome. Taxes to raise the money. Revolt to Alexandria. Ptolemy's flight. Berenice. Her marriage with Seleucus. Cleopatra's early life. Ptolemy, an object of contempt. Ptolemy's interview with Cato. Character of Cato. Ptolemy's reception. Cato's advice to him. Ptolemy arrives at Rome. His application to Pompey. Action of the Roman Senate. Plans for restoring Ptolemy. Measures of Berenice. Her embassage to Rome. Ptolemy's treachery. Its consequences. Opposition to Ptolemy. The prophecy. Attempts to evade the oracle. Gabinius undertakes the cause. Mark Antony. His history and character. Antony in Greece. He joins Gabinius. Danger of crossing the deserts. Armies destroyed. Mark Antony's character. His personal appearance. March across the desert. Pelusium taken. March across the delta. Success of the Romans. Berenice a prisoner. Fate of Archelaus. Grief of Antony. Unnatural joy of Ptolemy. When the time was approaching in which Cleopatra appeared upon the stage, Rome was perhaps the only city that could be considered as the rival of Alexandria. In the estimation of mankind, in respect to interest and attractiveness as a capital, in one respect, Rome was vastly superior to the Egyptian metropolis, and that was in the magnitude and extent of the military power which it welled among the nations of the earth. Alexandria ruled over Egypt, and over a few of the neighboring coast and islands, but in the course of three centuries during which she had been acquiring her greatness and fame, the Roman Empire had extended itself over almost the whole civilized world. Egypt had been, thus far, too remote to be directly reached, but the affairs of Egypt itself became involved at length with the operations of the Roman power. About the time of Cleopatra's birth, in a very striking and peculiar manner, and as the consequences of the transaction were the means of turning the whole course of the Queen's subsequent history, a narration of it is necessary to a proper understanding of the circumstances under which she commenced her career. In fact, it was the extension of the Roman Empire to the limits of Egypt, and the connections which thence arose between the leading Roman generals and the Egyptian sovereign, which have made the story of this particular queen so much more conspicuous, and as an object of interest and attention to mankind, than that of any other one of the ten Cleopatras who rose successively in the same royal line. Ptolemy Alides, Cleopatra's father, was perhaps, in personal character, the most dissipated, degraded, and corrupt of all the sovereigns in the dynasty. He spent his whole time in vice and debauchery. The only honest accomplishment that he seemed to possess was his skill in playing upon the flute. Of this he was very vain. He instituted musical contests in which the musical performers of Alexandria played for prizes and crowns, and he himself was accustomed to enter the list with the rest as a competitor. The people of Alexandria, and the world in general, considered such pursuits as these wholly unworthy the attention of the representative of so illustrious a line of sovereigns, and the abhorrence which they felt for the monarch's vices and crimes was mingled with a feeling of contempt for the meanness of his ambition. There was a doubt in respect to his title to the crown, for his birth, on the mother's side, was irregular and ignoble. Instead, however, of attempting to confirm and secure his possession of power by vigorous and prosperous administration of the government, he wholly abandoned all concern in respect to the course of public affairs, and then, to guard against the danger of being deposed, 
he conceived the plan of getting himself recognized at Rome as one of the allies of the Roman people. If this were once done, he supposed that the Roman government would feel under an obligation to sustain him on his throne in the event of any threatened danger. The Roman government was a sort of republic, and the two most powerful men in the state at this time were Pompey and Caesar. Caesar was in the ascendancy at Rome at the time that Ptolemy made his application for an alliance. Pompey was absent in Asia Minor, being engaged in prosecuting a war with Mithridates, a very powerful monarch, who was at the time resisting the Roman power. Caesar was very deeply involved in debt, and was, moreover, very much in need of money, not only for relief from existing embarrassments, but as a means of subsequent expenditure, to enable him to accomplish certain great political schemes which he was entertaining. After many negotiations and delays, it was agreed that Caesar would exert his influence to secure an alliance between the Roman people and Ptolemy, on condition that Ptolemy paid him the sum of six thousand talents, equal to about six millions of dollars. A part of the money, Caesar said, was for Pompey. The title of ally was conferred, and Ptolemy undertook to raise the money which he had promised by increasing the taxes of his kingdom. The measures, however, which he thus adopted for the purpose of making himself the more secure in his possession of the throne, proved to be the means of overthrowing him. The discontent and disaffection of his people, which had been strong and universal before, though suppressed and concealed, broke out now into open violence. That there should be laid upon them, in addition to all their other burdens, these new oppressions, heavier than those which they had endured before, and exacted for such a purpose too, was not to be endured. To be compelled to see their country sold on any terms to the Roman people was sufficiently hard to bear. But to be forced to raise themselves and pay the price of the transfer was absolutely intolerable. Alexandria commenced a revolt. Ptolemy was not a man to act decidedly against such a demonstration, or, in fact, to evince either calmness or courage in any emergency whatever. His first thought was to escape from Alexandria to save his life. His second, to make the best of his way to Rome, to call upon the Roman people to come to the succor of their ally. Ptolemy left five children behind him in his flight. The eldest was the Princess Berenice, who had already reached maturity. The second was the great Cleopatra, the subject of this history. Cleopatra was, at this time, about eleven years old. There were also two sons, but they were very young. One of them was named Ptolemy. The Alexandrians, determined on raising Berenice to the throne, in her father's place, as soon as his flight was known. They thought that the sons were too young to attempt to reign in such an emergency, as it was very probable that Aletes, the father, would attempt to recover his kingdom. Berenice very readily accepted the honor and power which were offered to her. She established herself at her father's palace, and began her reign in great magnificence and splendor. In process of time she thought that her position would be strengthened by a marriage with a royal prince from some neighboring realm. She first sent ambassadors to make proposals to the prince of Syria, named Antiochus. The ambassadors came back, bringing word that Antiochus was dead, but that he had a brother named Seleucus, upon whom the succession fell. Berenice then sent them back to make the same offers to him. He accepted the proposals, came to Egypt, and he and Berenice were married. After trying him for a while, Berenice found that for some reason or other she did not like him as a husband, and, accordingly, she caused him to be strangled. At length, after various other intrigues and much secret management, Berenice succeeded in a second negotiation and married a prince or a pretended prince, from some country of Asia Minor, whose name was Archelaus. She was better pleased with the second husband than she had been with the first, and she began at last to feel somewhat settled and established on her throne, and to be prepared, as she thought, to offer effectual resistance to her father in case he should ever attempt to return. It was in the midst of the scenes, and surrounded by the influences which might be expected to prevail in the families of such a father and such a sister, that Cleopatra spent those years of her life in which the character is formed. 
during all these revolutions and exposed to all these exhibitions of licentious wickedness and of unnatural cruelty and crime, she was growing up in the royal palaces a spirited and beautiful but indulged and neglected child. In the meantime, Alettes, the father, went on toward Rome. So far as his character and his story were known, among the surrounding nations, he was the object of universal obloquy, both on accounts of his previous career of degrading vice, and now still more for this ignoble flight from the difficulties in which his vices and crimes had involved him. He stopped on the way at the island of Rhodes. It happened that Cato, the great Roman philosopher in general, was at Rhodes at this time. Cato was a man of stern, unbending virtue, and of great influence at that period in public affairs. Ptolemy sent a messenger to inform Cato of his arrival, supposing, of course, that the Roman general would hasten on hearing of the fact to pay his respects to so great a personage as he, a king of Egypt, a Ptolemy, though suffering under a temporary reverse of fortune. Cato directed the messenger to reply that, so far as he was aware, he had no particular business with Ptolemy. Say, however, to the king, he added, that if he has any business with me, he may call and see me, if he pleases. Ptolemy was obliged to suppress his resentment and submit. He thought it very essential to the success of his plans that he should see Cato, and secure, if possible, his interest and cooperation. And he consequently made preparations for paying, instead of receiving, the visit, intending to go in the greatest royal state that he could command. He accordingly appeared at Cato's lodgings on the following day, magnificently dressed, and accompanied by many attendants. Cato, who was dressed in the plainest and most simple manner, and whose apartment was furnished in a style corresponding with the severity of his character, did not even rise when the king entered the room. He simply pointed with his hand and bade the visitor take a seat. Ptolemy began to make a statement of his case with a view to obtaining Cato's influence with the Roman people to induce them to interpose in his behalf. Cato, however, far from evincing any disposition to espouse his visitor's cause, censured him, in the plainest terms, for having abandoned his proper position in his own kingdom, to go and make himself a victim and prey for the insatiable avarice of the Roman leaders. You can do nothing at Rome, he said but by the influence of bribes. And all the resources of Egypt will not be enough to satisfy the Roman greediness for money. He concluded by recommending him to go back to Alexandria and rely for his hope of extrication from the difficulties which surrounded him on the exercise of his own energy and resolution there. Ptolemy was greatly abashed at this rebuff, but, on consultation with his attendants and followers, it was decided to be too late now to return. The whole party accordingly re-embarked on their galleys, and pursued their way to Rome. Ptolemy found, on his arrival at the city, that Caesar was absent in Gaul, while Pompey, on the other hand, who had returned victorious from his campaigns against Mithridates, was now the great leader of influence and power at the capital. This change of circumstances was not, however, particularly unfavorable, for Ptolemy was on friendly terms with Pompey as he had been with Caesar. He had assisted him in his wars with Mithridates by sending him a squadron of horse, in pursuance of his policy of cultivating friendly relations with the Roman people by every means in his power. Besides, Pompey had received a part of the money which Ptolemy had paid to Caesar as the price of the Roman alliance, and was to receive his share of the rest in case Ptolemy should ever be restored. Pompey was accordingly interested in favoring the royal fugitive's cause, he received him in his palace, entertained him in magnificent style, and took immediate measures for bringing his cause before the Roman Senate, urging upon that body the adoption of immediate and vigorous measures for effecting his restoration, as an ally whom they were bound to protect against his rebellious subjects. There was at first some opposition in the Roman Senate against espousing the cause of such a man, but it was soon put down, being overpowered in part by Pompey's authority and in part silenced by Ptolemy's promises and bribes. The Senate determined to restore the king to his throne, and began to make arrangements for carrying the measure into effect. The Roman provinces nearest to Egypt were 
Cilicia and Syria, countries situated on the eastern and northeastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, north of Judea. The forces stationed in these provinces would be, of course, the most convenient for furnishing the necessary troops for the expedition. The province of Cilicia was under the command of Consul Lentulus. Lentulus was at this time at Rome. He had repaired to the capital for some temporary purpose, leaving his province and the troops stationed under the command, for the time, of a sort of lieutenant general named Gabinius. It was concluded that this Lentulus, with his Syrian forces, should undertake the task of reinstating Ptolemy on his throne. While these plans and arrangements were yet immature, a circumstance occurred which threatened, for a time, wholly to defeat them. It seems that when Cleopatra's father first left Egypt, he had caused a report to be circulated that he had been killed in the revolt. The object of this stratagem was to cover and conceal his flight. The government of Berenice soon discovered the truth, and learned that the fugitive had gone in the direction of Rome. They immediately inferred that he was going to appeal to the Roman people for aid, and they determined that if that were the case, the Roman people, before deciding in his favor, should have the opportunity to hear their side of the story as well as his. They accordingly made preparations at once for sending a very imposing embassage to Rome. The deputation consisted of more than a hundred persons. The object of Berenice's government in sending so large a number was not only to evince their respect for the Roman people and their sense of the magnitude of the question at issue, but also to guard against any efforts that Ptolemy might make to intercept the embassage on the way or to buy off the members of it by bribes. The number, however large as it was, proved insufficient to accomplish this purpose. The whole Roman world was at this time in such a condition of disorder and violence, in the hands of the desperate and reckless military leaders who then bore sway, that there were everywhere abundant facilities for the commission of any conceivable crime. Ptolemy contrived, with the assistance of the fierce partisans who had espoused his cause, and who were deeply interested in his success on account of the rewards which were promised them, to waylay and destroy a large proportion of this company before they reached Rome. Some were assassinated, some were poisoned, some were tampered with and bought off by bribes. A small remnant reached Rome, but they were so intimidated by the dangers which surrounded them that they did not dare to take any public action in respect to the business which had been committed to their charge. Ptolemy began to congratulate himself on having completely circumvented his daughter in her efforts to protect herself against his designs. Instead of that, however, it was soon proved that the effect of this atrocious treachery was exactly the contrary of what its perpetrators had expected. The knowledge of the facts became gradually extended among the people of Rome, and it awakened a universal indignation. The party who had been originally opposed to Ptolemy's cause seized the opportunity to renew their opposition, and they gained so much strength from the general odium which Ptolemy's crimes had awakened, that Pompey found it almost impossible to sustain his cause. At length the party opposed to Ptolemy found, or pretended to find, in certain sacred books, called the Sublime Oracles, which were kept in the custody of the priest, and were supposed to contain prophetic intimations of the will of heaven in respect to the conduct of public affairs, the following passage. If a king of Egypt should apply to you for aid, treat him in a friendly manner, but do not furnish him with troops, for if you do, you will incur great danger. This made new difficulty for Ptolemy's friends. They attempted, at first, to evade this inspired injunction by denying the reality of it, there was no such passage to be found, they said. It was all an invention of their enemies. This point seems to have been overruled. And then they attempted to give the passage some other than obvious interpretation. Finally they maintained that, although it prohibited the furnishing of Ptolemy himself with troops, it did not forbid their sending an armed force into Egypt under leaders of their own. That they could certainly do. And then, when the rebellion was suppressed, and Berenice government overthrown, they could invite Ptolemy to return to his kingdom and resume his crown in a peaceful manner. This, they alleged, would not be furnishing him with troops, and of course would not be disobeying the oracle. 
These attempts to evade the direction of the oracle on the part of Ptolemy's friends only made the debates and dissensions between them and his enemies more violent than ever. Pompey made every effort in his power to aid Ptolemy's cause, but Lentulus, after a long hesitation and delay, decided that it would not be safe for him to embark in it. At length, however, Gabinius, the lieutenant who commanded in Syria, was induced to undertake the enterprise. On certain promises, which he received from Ptolemy, to be performed in case he succeeded, and with a certain encouragement, not very legal or regular, which Pompey gave him in respect to the employment of the Roman troops under his command, he resolved to march to Egypt. His route, of course, would lie along the shores of the Mediterranean and through the desert to Pelusium, which has already been mentioned as the frontier town on this side of Egypt. From Pelusium, he was to march through the heart of the delta to Alexandria, and, if successful in his invasion, overthrow the government of Berenice and Archelaus, and then, inviting Ptolemy to return, reinstate him on the throne. In the prosecution of this dangerous enterprise, Gabinius relied strongly on the assistance of a very remarkable man, then his second-in-command, who afterward acted a very important part in the subsequent history of Cleopatra. His name was Mark Antony. Antony was born in Rome, of a very distinguished family, but his father died when he was very young, and being left subsequently much to himself, he became a very wild and dissolute young man. He wasted the property which his father had left him in folly and vice, and then going on disparately in the same career, he soon incurred enormous debts, and involved himself in consequence, in extricable difficulties. His creditors continually harassed him with importunities for money, and with suits at law to compel payments which he had no means of making. He was likewise incessantly pursued by the hostility of the many enemies that he had made in the city by his violence and his crimes. At length he absconded and went to Greece. Here Gabinius, when on his way to Syria, met him, and invited him to join his army rather than to remain in his idleness and destitution. Antony, who was as proud and lofty in spirit as he was degraded in morals and condition, refused to do this unless Gabinius would give him a command. Gabinius saw in the daring and reckless energy which Antony manifested the indications of the class of qualities which in those days made a successful soldier, ascended to his terms. He gave him command of his cavalry. Antony distinguished himself in the Syrian campaigns that followed, and was now full of eagerness to engage in this Egyptian enterprise. In fact, it was mainly his zeal and enthusiasm to embark in this undertaking which was the means of deciding Gabinius to consent to Ptolemy's proposals. The danger and difficulty which they considered as most to be apprehended in the whole expedition was the getting across the desert to Pelusium. In fact, the great protection of Egypt had always been her isolation. The trackless and desolate sands, being wholly destitute of water and utterly void, could be traversed, even by caravan of peaceful travelers, only with great difficulty and danger. For an army to attempt to cross them, exposed, as the troops would necessarily be, to the assaults of enemies who might advance to meet them on the way, and sure of encountering a terrible opposition from fresh and vigorous bands when they should arrive, way worn and exhausted by the physical hardships of the way at the borders of the inhabited country, was a desperate undertaking. Many instances occurred in ancient times in which vast bodies of troops, in attempting marches over the deserts by which Egypt was surrounded, were wholly destroyed by famine or thirst, or overwhelmed by storms of sand. These difficulties and dangers, however, did not at all intimidate Mark Antony. The anticipation, in fact, of the glory of surmounting them was one of the main inducements which led him to embark in the enterprise. The perils of the desert constituted one of the charms which made the expedition so attractive. He placed himself, therefore, at the head of his troop cavalry, and set off across the sands in advance of Gabinius to take Pelusium, in order thus to open a way for the main body of the army into Egypt. Ptolemy accompanied Antony. Gabinius was to follow with all his faults, to call them by no severer name, Mark Antony possessed certain great excellences of character. He was ardent, but then he was cool, collected, and sagacious, 
and there was a certain frank and manly generosity continually evincing itself in his conduct and character, which made him a great favorite among his men. He was at this time about twenty-eight years old, of a tall and manly form, and of an expressive and intellectual cast of countenance. His forehead was high, his nose aquiline, and his eyes full of vivacity and life. He was accustomed to dress in a very plain and careless manner, and he assumed an air of the utmost familiarity and freedom in his intercourse with his soldiers. He would join them in their sports, joke with them, and good-naturedly receive their jokes in return, and take his meals, standing with them around their rude tables, in the open field. Such habits of intercourse with his men in a commander of ordinary character would have been fatal to his ascendancy over them, but in Mark Antony's case, these frank and familiar manners, which seemed only to make military genius and the intellectual power which he possessed the more conspicuous and the more universally admired. Antony conducted his troops of horsemen across the desert in a very safe and speedy manner, and arrived before Pelusium. The city was not prepared to resist him. It surrendered at once, and the whole garrison fell into his hands as prisoners of war. Ptolemy demanded that they should all be immediately killed. They were rebels, he said and as such ought to be put to death. Antony, however, as might have been expected from his character, absolutely refused to allow any such barbarity. Ptolemy, since the power was not yet in his hands, was compelled to submit, and to postpone gratifying the spirit of vengeance which he had so long been slumbering in his breast to a future day. He could the more patiently submit to this necessity, since it appeared that the day of his complete and final triumph over his daughter and all her adherents was now very nigh at hand. In fact, Berenice and her government, when they heard of the arrival of Antony and Ptolemy at Pelusium, of the fall of that city, and of the approach of Gabinius with an overwhelming force of Roman soldiers, were struck with dismay. Archelaus, the husband of Berenice, had been in former years a personal friend of Antony's, Antony considered, in fact, that they were friends still, though required by what the historian calls their duty to fight each other for the possession of the kingdom. The government of Berenice raised an army. Archelaus took command of it, and advanced to meet the enemy. In the meantime, Gabinius arrived with the main body of the Roman troops, and commenced his march in conjunction with Antony toward the capital. As they were obliged to make a circuit to the southward, in order to avoid the inlets and lagoons which, on the northern coast of Egypt, penetrate for some distance into the land, their course led them through the heart of the delta. Many battles were fought, the Romans everywhere gaining the victory. The Egyptian soldiers were, in fact, the discontented and mutinous, perhaps, in part, because they were considered the government on the side of which they were compelled to engage as, after all, a absorption. At length a great final battle was fought, which settled the controversy. Archelaus was slain upon the field, Berenice was taken prisoner, their government was wholly overthrown, and the way was open for the march of the Roman armies to Alexandria. Mark Antony, when judged by our standards, was certainly, as well as Ptolemy, a depraved and vicious man. But his depravity was of a very different type from that of Cleopatra's father. The difference in the men, in one respect, was very clearly evinced by the objects towards which their interest and attention were respectfully turned after this great battle. While the contest had been going on, the king and queen of Egypt, Archelaus and Berenice, were, of course, in the view of both Antony and Ptolemy, the two most conspicuous personages in the army of their enemies, and while Antony would naturally watch with the greatest interest the fate of his friend, the king, Ptolemy, would as naturally follow him with the highest concern the destiny of his daughter. Accordingly, when the battle was over, while the mind of Ptolemy might, as we should naturally expect, be chiefly occupied by the fact that his daughter was made a captive, Antony's, we might suppose, would be engrossed by the tidings that his friend had been slain. The one rejoiced, and the other mourned. Antony sought for the body of his friend on the field of battle and when it was found, he gave himself wholly to the work of providing for it a most magnificent burial. He seemed, at the funeral, to lament the death of his ancient comrade, with real and unaffected grief. Ptolemy, on the other hand, 
was overwhelmed with joy at finding his daughter his captive. The long-wished-for hour for the gratification of his revenge had come at last, and the first use which he had made of his power when he was put in possession of it at Alexandria was to order his daughter to be beheaded. End of chapter 4 Cleopatra's Father Recording by CalmDragon.net Chapter 5 of Cleopatra This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan Cleopatra by Jacob Abbott Chapter 5 Accession to the Throne Cleopatra Excitement in Alexandria Ptolemy restored Acquiescence of the people Festivities Popularity of Antony Antony's generosity Anecdote Antony and Cleopatra Antony returns to Rome Ptolemy's murders Pompey and Caesar Close of Ptolemy's reign Settlement of the succession Accession of Cleopatra She is married to her brother Pothinus the eunuch His character and government Machinations of Pothinus Cleopatra is expelled Cleopatra's army Approaching contest Caesar and Pompey Battle of Pharsalia Pompey at Pelusium Treachery of Pothinus Caesar's pursuit of Pompey His danger Caesar at Alexandria Astonishment of the Egyptians Caesar presented with Pompey's head Pompey's seal Situation of Caesar His demands Conduct of Pothinus Quarrels Policy of Pothinus Contentions Caesar sends to Syria for additional troops At the time when the unnatural quarrel between Cleopatra's father and her sister was working its way toward its dreadful termination, as related in the last chapter, she herself was residing at the royal palace in Alexandria, a blooming and beautiful girl of about fifteen. Fortunately for her, she was too young to take any active part personally in the contention. Her two brothers were still younger than herself. They all three remained, therefore, in the royal palaces, quiet spectators of the revolution, without being either benefited or injured by it. It is singular that the name of both the boys was Ptolemy. The excitement in the city of Alexandria was intense and universal when the Roman army entered it to reinstate Cleopatra's father upon his throne. A very large portion of the inhabitants were pleased with having the former king restored. In fact, it appears, by a retrospect of the history of kings, that when a legitimate hereditary sovereign or dynasty is deposed and expelled by a rebellious population, no matter how intolerable may have been the tyranny, or how atrocious the crimes by which the patience of the subject was exhausted, the lapse of a very few years is ordinarily sufficient to produce a very general readiness to acquiesce in a restoration, and in this particular instance there had been no such superiority in the government of Berenice during the period while her power continued over that of her father which she had displaced as to make this case an exception to the general rule. The mass of people, therefore, all those especially who had taken no active part in Berenice's government, were ready to welcome Ptolemy back to his capital. Those who had taken such a part were all summarily executed by Ptolemy's orders. There was, of course, a great excitement throughout the city on the arrival of the Roman army. All the foreign influence and power which had been exercised in Egypt thus far, and almost all the officers, whether civil or military, had been Greek. The coming of the Romans 
was the introduction of a new element of interest to add to the endless variety of excitements which animated the capital. The restoration of Ptolemy was celebrated with games, spectacles, and festivities of every kind, and of course, next to the king himself, the chief center of interest and attraction in all these public rejoicings would be the distinguished foreign generals by whose instrumentality the end had been gained. Mark Antony was a special object of public regard and admiration at the time. His eccentric manners, his frank and honest air, his Roman simplicity of dress and demeanor made him conspicuous, and his interposition to save the lives of the captured garrison of Pelusium and the interest which he took in rendering such distinguished funeral honors to the enemy whom his army had slain in battle impressed the people with the idea of a certain nobleness and magnanimity in his character which, in spite of his faults, made him an object of general admiration and applause. The very faults of such a man assume often, in the eyes of the world, the guise and semblance of virtues. For example, it is related of Anthony that at one time in the course of his life, having a desire to make a present of some kind to a certain person, in requital for a favor which he had received from him, he ordered his treasurer to send a sum of money to his friend, and named for the sum to be sent an amount considerably greater than was really required under the circumstances of the case, acting thus, as he often did, under the influence of a blind and uncalculating generosity. The treasurer, more prudent than his master, wished to reduce the amount, but he did not dare directly to propose a reduction, so he counted out the money, and laid it in a pile in a place where Anthony was to pass, thinking that when Anthony saw the amount, he would perceive that it was too great. Anthony, in passing by, asked what the money was. The treasurer said it was the sum that he had ordered to be sent as a present to such a person, naming the individual intended. Antony was quick to perceive the object of the treasurer's maneuver. He immediately replied, Ha! Is that all? I thought the sum I named would make a better appearance than that. Send him double the amount. To determine, under such circumstances as these, to double an extravagance merely for the purpose of thwarting the honest attempt of a faithful servant to diminish it, made, too, in so cautious and delicate a way, is most certainly a fault. But it is one of those faults for which the world, in all ages, will persist in admiring and praising the perpetrator. In a word, Antony became the object of general attention and favor during his continuance at Alexandria. Whether he particularly attracted Cleopatra's attention at this time or not does not appear. She, however, strongly attracted his. He admired her blooming beauty, her sprightliness and wit, and her various accomplishments. She was still, however, so young, being but fifteen years of age, while Antony was nearly thirty, that she probably made no very serious impression upon him. A short time after this, Antony went back to Rome, and did not see Cleopatra again for many years. When the two Roman generals went away from Alexandria, they left a considerable portion of the army behind them, under Ptolemy's command, to aid him in keeping possession of his throne. Antony returned to Rome. He acquired great renown by his march across the desert, and by the successful accomplishment of the invasion of Egypt and the restoration of Ptolemy. His funds, too, were replenished by the vast sums paid to him and to Gabinus by Ptolemy. The amount which Ptolemy is said to have agreed to pay as the price of his restoration was two thousand talents, equal to ten millions of dollars, a sum which shows on how great a scale the operations of this celebrated campaign were conducted. Ptolemy raised a large portion of the money required for his payments by confiscating the estates belonging to those friends of Berenice's government whom he ordered to be slain. It was said, in fact, that the numbers were very much increased of those that were condemned to die by Ptolemy's standing in such urgent need of their property to meet his obligations. Antony, through the results of this campaign, found himself suddenly raised from the position of a disgraced and homeless fugitive to that of one of the most wealthy and renowned, 
and consequently one of the most powerful personages in rome the great civil war broke out about this time between caesar and pompey antony espoused the cause of caesar in the meantime while the civil war between caesar and pompey was raging ptolemy succeeded in maintaining his seat on the throne by the aid of the roman soldiers whom antony and gabinius had left him for about three years when he found himself drawing toward the close of life the question arose to his mind to whom he should leave his kingdom cleopatra was the oldest child and she was a princess of great promise both in respect to mental endowments and personal charms her brothers were considerably younger than she the claim of a son though younger seemed to be naturally stronger than that of a daughter but the commanding talents and rising influence of cleopatra appeared to make it doubtful whether it would be safe to pass her by the father settled the question in the way in which such difficulties were usually surmounted in the ptolemy family he ordained that cleopatra should marry the oldest of her brothers and that they too should jointly occupy the throne adhering also still to the idea of the alliance of egypt with rome which had been the leading principle of the whole policy of his reign he solemnly committed the execution of his will and the guardianship of his children by a provision of the instrument itself to the roman senate the senate accepted the appointment and appointed pompey as the agent on their part to perform the duties of the trust the attention of pompey was immediately after that time too much engrossed by the civil war waged between himself and caesar to take any active steps in respect to the duties of his appointment it seemed however that none were necessary for all parties in alexandria appearing disposed after the death of the king to acquiesce in the arrangements which he had made and to join in carrying them into effect cleopatra was married to her brother yet it is true only a boy he was about ten years old she was herself about eighteen they were both too young to govern they could only reign the affairs of the kingdom were accordingly conducted by two ministers whom their father had designated these ministers were pothinus a eunuch who was a sort of secretary of state and achilles the commander-in-chief of the armies thus though cleopatra by these events became nominally a queen her real accession through the throne was not yet accomplished there were still many difficulties and dangers to be passed through before the period arrived when she became really a sovereign she did not herself make any immediate attempt to hasten this period but seems to have acquiesced on the other hand very quietly for a time in the arrangements which her father had made pothinus was a eunuch he had been for a long time an officer of government under ptolemy the father he was a proud ambitious and domineering man determined to rule and very unscrupulous in respect to the means which he adopted to accomplish his ends he had been accustomed to regard cleopatra as a mere child now that she was queen he was very unwilling that the real power should pass into her hands the jealousy and ill-will which he felt toward her increased rapidly as he found in the course of the first two or three years after her father's death that she was advancing rapidly in strength of character and in the influence and ascendancy which she was acquiring over all around her her beauty her accomplishments and a certain indescribable charm which pervaded all her demeanor combined to give her great personal power but while these things awakened in other minds feelings of interest in cleopatra and attachment to her they only increased the jealousy and envy of pothinus cleopatra was becoming his rival he endeavored to thwart and circumvent her he acted toward her in a haughty and overbearing manner in order to keep her down to what he considered her proper place as his ward for he was yet the guardian both of cleopatra and her husband and the regent of the realm cleopatra had a great deal of what is sometimes called spirit and her resentment was aroused by this treatment pothinus took pains to enlist her young husband ptolemy on his side as the quarrel advanced ptolemy was younger and of a character much less marked and decided than cleopatra 
Pothinus saw that he could maintain control over him much more easily and for a much longer time than over Cleopatra. He contrived to awaken the young Ptolemy's jealousy of his wife's rising influence, and to induce him to join in efforts to thwart and counteract it. These attempts to turn her husband against her only aroused Cleopatra's resentment the more. Hers was not a spirit to be coerced. The palace was filled with the dissensions of the rivals. Pothinus and Ptolemy began to take measures for securing the army on their side. An open rupture finally ensued, and Cleopatra was expelled from the kingdom. She went to Syria. Syria was the nearest place of refuge, and then, besides, it was the country from which the aid had been furnished by which her father had been restored to the throne when he had been expelled, in a similar manner, many years before. Her father, it is true, had gone first to Rome, but the succors which he had negotiated for had been sent from Syria. Cleopatra hoped to obtain the same assistance by going directly there. Nor was she disappointed. She obtained an army, and commenced her march toward Egypt, following the same track which Antony and Gabinius had pursued in coming to reinstate her father. Pothinus raised an army, and went forth to meet her. He took Achilles as the commander of the troops, and the young Ptolemy as the nominal sovereign, while he, as the younger king's guardian and prime minister, exercised the real power. The troops of Pothinus advanced to Pelusium. Here they met the forces of Cleopatra coming from the east, the armies encamped not very far from each other, and both sides began to prepare for battle. The battle, however, was not fought. It was prevented by the occurrence of certain great and unforeseen events which at this crisis suddenly burst upon the scene of Egyptian history, and turned the whole current of affairs into new and unexpected channels. The breaking out of the civil war between the great Roman generals Caesar and Pompey, and their respective partisans, has already been mentioned as having occurred soon after the death of Cleopatra's father, and as having prevented Pompey from undertaking the office of executor of the will. This war had been raging ever since that time with terrible fury. Its distant thundering had been heard even in Egypt, but it was too remote to awaken there any special alarm. The immense armies of these two mighty conquerors had moved slowly, like two ferocious birds of prey flying through the air and fighting as they fly, across Italy into Greece, and from Greece through Macedon, into Thessaly, contending in dreadful struggles with each other as they advanced, and trampling down and destroying everything in their way. At length a great final battle had been fought at Pharsalia. Pompey had been totally defeated. He had fled to the seashore, and there, with a few ships and a small number of followers, he had pushed out upon the Mediterranean, not knowing whither to fly, and overwhelmed with wretchedness and despair. Caesar followed him in eager pursuit. He had a small fleet of galleys with him, on board of which he had embarked two or three thousand men. This was a force suitable, perhaps, for the pursuit of a fugitive, but wholly insufficient for any other design. Pompey thought of Ptolemy. He remembered the efforts which he himself had made for the cause of Ptolemy Polites at Rome, and the success of those efforts in securing that monarch's restoration, an event through which alone the young Ptolemy had been enabled to attain the crown. He came, therefore, to Pelusium, his little fleet off the shore, sent to the land to ask Ptolemy to receive and protect him. Pothinus, who was really the commander in Ptolemy's army, made an answer to this application that Pompey should be received and protected, and that he would send out a boat to bring him to the shore. Pompey felt some misgivings in respect to this proffered hospitality, but he finally concluded to go to the shore in the boat which Pothinus sent for him. As soon as he landed, the Egyptians, by Pothinus's orders, stabbed and beheaded him on the sand. Pothinus and his council had decided that this would be the safest course. If they were to receive Pompey, they reasoned, Caesar would be made their enemy, and if they refused to receive him, Pompey himself would be offended, 
and they did not know which of the two it would be safe to displease, for they did not know in what way, if both the generals were to be allowed to live, the war would ultimately end. But by killing Pompey, they said, we shall be sure to please Caesar, and Pompey himself will lie still. In the meantime, Caesar, not knowing to what part of Egypt Pompey had fled, pressed on directly to Alexandria. He exposed himself to great danger in so doing, for the forces under his command were not sufficient to protect him in case of his becoming involved in difficulties with the authorities there. Nor could he, when once arrived on the Egyptian coast, easily go away again, for at the season of the year in which these events occurred, there was a periodical wind which blew steadily toward that part of the coast, and while it made it very easy for a fleet of ships to go to Alexandria, rendered it almost impossible for them to return. Caesar was very little accustomed to shrink from danger in any of his enterprises and plans, though still he was usually prudent and circumspect. In this instance, however, his ardent interest in the pursuit of Pompey overruled all considerations of personal safety. He arrived at Alexandria, but he found that Pompey was not there. He anchored his vessels in the port, landed his troops, and established himself in the city. These two events, the assassination of one of the great Roman generals on the eastern extremity of the coast, and the arrival of the other at the same moment at Alexandria on the western, burst suddenly upon Egypt together like simultaneous claps of thunder. The tidings struck the whole country with astonishment, and immediately engrossed universal attention. At the camps both of Cleopatra and Ptolemy at Pelusium, all was excitement and wonder. Instead of thinking of a battle, both parties were wholly occupied in speculating on the results which were likely to accrue to one side or to the other, under the totally new and unexpected aspect which public affairs had assumed. Of course the thoughts of all were turned toward Alexandria. Pothinus immediately proceeded to the city, taking with him the young king. Achilles, too, either accompanied them or followed soon afterward. They carried with them the head of Pompey, which they had cut off on the shore where they had killed him, and also a seal which they took from his finger. When they arrived at Alexandria, they sent the head, wrapped in a cloth, and also the seal, as presents to Caesar. Accustomed as they were to the brutal deeds and heartless cruelties of the Ptolemies, they supposed that Caesar would exult at the spectacle of the dissevered and ghastly head of his great rival and enemy. Instead of this, he was shocked and displeased, and ordered the head to be buried with the most solemn and imposing funeral ceremonies. He, however, accepted and kept the seal. The device engraved upon it was a lion holding a sword in his paw, a fit emblem of the characteristics of the men who, though in many respects magnanimous and just, had filled the whole world with the terror of their quarrels. The army of Ptolemy, while he himself and his immediate counselors went to Alexandria, was left at Pelusium under the command of other officers to watch Cleopatra. Cleopatra herself would have been pleased also to repair to Alexandria and appeal to Caesar if it had been in her power to do so, but she was beyond the confines of the country, with a powerful army of her enemies ready to intercept her on any attempt to enter or pass through it. She remained, therefore, at Pelusium, uncertain what to do. In the meantime, Caesar soon found himself in a somewhat embarrassing situation at Alexandria. He had been accustomed for many years to the possession and the exercise of the most absolute and despotic power, wherever he might be, and now that Pompey, his great rival, was dead, he considered himself the monarch and master of the world. He had not, however, at Alexandria, any means sufficient to maintain and enforce such pretensions and yet he was not of a spirit to abate, on that account, in the slightest degree, the advancing of them. He established himself in the palaces of Alexandria, as if he were himself the king. He moved in state through the streets of the city at the head of his guards, and displaying the customary emblems 
and supreme authority used at Rome. He claimed the six thousand talents which Ptolemy Aulides had formerly promised him for procuring a treaty of alliance with Rome, and he called upon Pothinus to pay the balance due. He said, moreover, that by the will of Aulides the Roman people had been made the executor, and that it devolved him as the Roman consul, and consequently the representative of the Roman people, to assume that trust, and in the discharge of it to settle the dispute between Ptolemy and Cleopatra, and he called upon Ptolemy to prepare and lay before him a statement of his claims and the grounds on which he maintained his right to the throne to the exclusion of Cleopatra. On the other hand, Pothinus, who had been as little accustomed to acknowledge a superior as Caesar, though his supremacy and domination had been exercised on a somewhat humbler scale, was obstinate and pertinacious in resisting all these demands, though the means and methods which he resorted to were of a character corresponding to his weak and ignoble mind. He fomented quarrels in the streets between the Alexandrian populace and Caesar's soldiers. He thought that, as the number of troops under Caesar's command in the city and of vessels in the port was small, he could tease and worry the Romans with impunity, though he had not the courage openly to attack them. He pretended to be a friend, or, at least, not an enemy, and yet he conducted himself toward them in an overbearing and insolent manner. He had agreed to make arrangements for supplying them with food, and he did this by procuring damaged provisions of a most wretched quality, and when the soldiers remonstrated, he said to them that they who lived at other people's cost had no right to complain of their fare. He caused wooden and earthen vessels to be used in the palace, and said, in explanation, that he had been compelled to sell all the gold and silver plate of the royal household to meet the exactions of Caesar. He busied himself, too, about the city, in endeavoring to excite odium against Caesar's proposal to hear and decide the question at issue between Cleopatra and Ptolemy. Ptolemy was a sovereign, he said, and was not amenable to any foreign power whatever. Thus, without the courage or the energy to attempt any open, manly, and effectual system of hostility, he contented himself with making all the difficulty in his power by urging an incessant pressure of petty, vexatious, and provoking but useless annoyances. Caesar's demands may have been unjust, but they were bold, manly, and undisguised. The eunuch may have been right in resisting them, but the mode was so mean and contemptible that mankind have always taken part with Caesar in the sentiments which they have formed as spectators of the contest. With the very small force which Caesar had at his command, and shut up as he was in the midst of a very great and powerful city, in which both the garrison and the population were growing more and more hostile to him every day, he soon found his situation was beginning to be attended with very serious danger. He could not retire from the scene. He probably would not have retired if he could have done so. He remained, therefore, in the city, conducting himself all the time with prudence and circumspection, but yet maintaining, as at first, the same air of confident self-possession and superiority which always characterized his demeanor. He, however, dispatched a messenger forthwith into Syria, the nearest country under the Roman sway, with orders that several legions, which were posted there, should be embarked and forwarded to Alexandria with the utmost possible celerity. End of chapter 5